everybody, it's Robert Dunt from arctop10.com and I'm very excited to be chatting to Patricia Vol. Patricia, hello. Hello, hi. Hi. So, it's very exciting. You are the first sculptor I've been chatting to. <laughs> yes, we get in everywhere, don't we? We'll have to give it a try. We're the th I'm one of those people that get in the way of the painting. Oh, I don't know about that. gets away in the painting. <laughs> So, so what, what made you want to be a, a sculptor? Um, it's funny, it goes right back. I always really wanted to um, be a painter or, or sort of a graphic designer or something like that. But as soon as I started to work with clay, I'm afraid clay picked me. I remember someone telling me that one time, your materials pick you rather than you picking the material. I, I always loved drawing and... Um, that's what I got, did well at school, but on going into uh, sort of being a mature, mature student, went back and did a foundation course and started to clay. And I remember there was one particular time I was having a lot of difficulty with a piece I was making and the tutor turned around to me and he said, I don't know why you're having so much difficulty when you're making something that's so beautiful. Oh, man. And it really got me. I thought... Maybe I'm not such a dead loss after all. <laughs> it was because I was so pedantic. I wanted it to be perfect and right yeah, yeah. and agonising over it rather than accepting what I was making. So it was a, I, I think it's a good thing that tutors should always maybe uh, give a little bit of confidence to their students. Yeah, no, because I... if someone hadn't said that to me at that particular time, I might have thought, I'm just awful at this, so I'm just not going to be <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's and actually, then I really sorry no no it's actually really interesting what you said about the, the materials choosing you because I was I started painting when I was a journalist at the time actually I was working on a I was a politics and religion reporter for the Surrey Appetizer and I had um, I had a bit of time off work because I did all these boring late night council meetings um, and my wife had gone back to work and I went out and bought these acrylic paints and canvas and as soon as I put this yellow on I thought oh man I'm going to have to be a painter so, interesting how uh, yes, they do choose you. So, so tell me about the clay. What is it about it that really gets you? Um, uh, I think it's something I've, I've got complete control over. No. It, I did use, work in stone for a while as well, but I'm a bit obsessive compulsive. So I would find that if I started on stone, I would just keep on going. Like I'd work all night until I fell over. <laughs> Whereas with clay, you have to work with it. You have to give it time to go off, to build a little bit more. I um, So that works really well for me. Um, so that's really... Also, the whole act of construction, maybe it's because I come from a building background. My father was a builder. Okay. Um, and seeing craftsmen at work, I always got a, a terrific thrill. I just seen. I remember watching a bricklayer when I was a child laying bricks yeah. and being absolutely astounded at the skill they would have. <laughs> I know that sounds really daft, no, 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 but no. I think it's the same thing as I've been able to see with uh, some of your interviews with painters. Yeah. Like it's not completely about the narrative or it being figurative, but it's also about the operation and the skill of laying on the paints and the craft of actually doing the work. Absolutely. And that's where it takes a long time to build up that craft. You start off with maybe making a little sort of figure or something like that. And then you move up to something bigger and then bigger and bigger. I would have liked to have learned how to do um, arc welding and got into metalwork. But again, I'm a little bit too hands on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I could have seen me if I was in the middle of doing weld I'd stick my hands in it and <laughs> find that my hands got welded to the metal so in a way it was better that I stayed with the clay and maybe got someone else that could keep their hands to themselves doing the metal work <laughs> so, so, so just tell me because I'm, I'm quite interested I don't actually know how how you would make something out of clay pra practically what, what are the sort of stages you go through to make a sculpture that starts with clay I think there's various ways of working with clay. You can work with like you can work solidly on an armature yeah. and then at, then get it cast into bronze, or you can do much more the way I do. Work with big coils, like big ploy, rolls of clay, and you literally turn it round and round and round, and then model into it. Or again, you can use on the pieces that I've just done over the last year. You do large slabs of clay yeah. and then just draw into the clay. And then 
do it that way. Leave it until it's sort of leather hard and then you can construct, construct. If you look at some of my pieces, especially the pieces I've done uh, this year and last year, that has all been sort of big slabs and you might roll them around and make them all, all individual pieces and then fire them and then construct. But I think with working with clay, I've got full, full control over the material because I fire it, bring it out, finish it. I don't have to hand it over to a bronze caster who will then cast it in, in whatever way they do, then do the patina. Although I would love to, ha I, lo I have done that before in the past. Yeah. Uh, I like the thought with clay. It's quite a cheap material as well. You can keep trying. You okay. might do something and it doesn't really work. It's not the end of the world. You can take it apart and redo it again and work on it again. Uh, it does, as far as construction is concerned, it, you are restricted by the size of your kiln. But again, okay. I've got around that by working on various sizes and then stacking. Um, so that be done in maybe four or five pieces and then you construct again afterwards. So there is restrictions on doing it. But sounds, I like the complete control. That sounds really cool. So, so, so shall I bring in one of the pictures we've got? Right. If you look at that particular bit, you can see on the table there are there's a big sort of like structure there, or a, a large structure. That was done by a big slab of clay. I drew out a line, mm. then straight, straight pieces, and then sort of like, as I say, built it. Uh, but if you, you now look at, say, the piece that has the... Uh, bands around it. Yeah. Um, they the pieces then will all be put. Well, they'll all be fired separately. Then they'll all be glued together, and then there'll be elastic bands put round it to hold it in the structure together. Okay. So it's quite different from what people normally do with clay, um, which I think maybe some other people do do that, but I think I'm about the only people person that I know at the moment that's doing that sort of thing. So, so on, in the studio picture, that there's a piece. It looks a bit like a horseshoe, like a curved horseshoe. Yeah, that, that's right. And so, do, so you, that, do you bend sorry. it or do you cut it? No. If you get a big, big flat piece of clay, yeah. And I literally cut out a shape like that, and then another shape like that, mm. and then a couple of straight lines, and over the top, do the straight lines on it, and then build on top. So nice. flat piece, uprights. And then another flat piece on top. Huh. It's, 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 it's really intriguing, actually. So you must get massive hunks of clay to start with. A big bag. I don't know if you can see in that, stu in that studio picture as well. There's a big slab roller at the side. It's like what you would put your clothes in if you want to get all the moisture out of them. So you put a clay, big bag of clay down there, and there's a big roller, and you roll it all down. So you get those lovely big flat surfaces so as you can cut into it. And while so, I'm, oh, I see. So, so when it arrives, it, it's I am I was imagining it arrives at this beautiful smooth surface, but it just arrives as a sort of hunk of stuff, doesn't it? That's right. And while I'm doing that as well, I'll, if there's any clay left over, I'll be making other structures. Again, almost at, at random. If you look at there's one particular piece there that looks like a totem pole. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that again is while I'm doing the big slabs, I'll make little individual pieces. And that will be that will, those will be fired as well, all at random. I haven't made up my mind at all in advance what way the piece is going to finish. And then I'll have all these pieces together, walk into the studio and drill and put rods through them and build up oh, and glue it, glue it all together. No, absolutely, absolutely fascinating. I'm just loving loving the story. So, 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 but you, do you have to fire them before you can drill them and put the holes in? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, you could. Some people would do it together, but I don't want that restrictions, and I don't want any set idea of how I have. I'm going to finish the piece, so I might have maybe twenty pieces, all little facets, no bigger facets that are all fired, and then I lay them all out in the studio, and look at the various sort of bits and combinations that I have there, and then put them together and think of what is the best arrangement. And again, I think um, I, I, looking at the geometry, I, to begin with, I was a little bit sort of um, frightened of doing this. And then I thought, well, let's just go with it. Because if it's me that's doing the line and me that's doing the structure, then 
logically they should come together and in, into a, a form that I feel works. But it also leaves it. Some don't. Some never work. Yeah. But so, most of them do. Because in a way, I've got to that sort of stage with the making that I've got confidence in the individual vocabulary of what I'm working in, that it will come together into a structure that is, is will work right. You have to work out a little bit of calculations of the size and proportions. Uh, for instance, in that big piece that you saw that was tied together with the, yeah. the, the bands, they do have to have the same sort of width. And there has yeah. to be right angles. That, that piece that you sort of said, how did you do the Big Ben piece? Mm. I did have to work out what size it, sh it should be across and, and depth and make sure that the other pieces that I put together are of the same width and depth. Sure. To because it doesn't, it doesn't have the same balance. It, again, I suppose it's the same way as a painter does when he's working across yeah. the whole geometry of his painting of what works in one place and what doesn't in another. And so, so is there a kind of an atmosphere, or a, what would you say you're trying to communicate in a way? I'm trying to say, with with, with when you feel the shapes work together, is there is it an atmosphere, or an emotion, or a, or a narrative? It's very funny that because I think sometimes people sort of look at my work and sort of say when they look at it, it makes them feel happy. And I can say sometimes when I'm working on it, I'm bloody unhappy. <laughs> which is because I'm so frustrated or it won't go or it falls down on the floor and it breaks. Or you have one of those days and every single thing that you lift up, up breaks. But I, what I'm, when I started to do clay work, originally I worked on figurative pieces, I made okay. big heads. Okay. If you do a Google, my head still sort of can't come up. And I never wanted to do sort of tightly figurative work. Like that's all been done in mm. antiquity and they did it superbly. Mm. I was looking for totems that were symbols of what we are all about. And I wanted it to be the asexual and there were heroic figures, but much more sort of maybe, as I say, totems. Okay. Or you would look at something and it you would know it was a head, but you wouldn't know whether it was female or male or whatever. And again, that was sort of relative to the Celtic cult of the head. Okay. Uh, and I got totally obsessed with that for quite a number of years. When I'd do the heads, I'd actually get to talking to the, these heads. <laughs> and then suddenly... I realised that they weren't talking back to me anymore. Mm. And that's when I changed completely into abstraction and working in the clay in a different way. But it still comes very much back to my Celtic roots. And the pieces that I've given you the photographs of mm. are, again, about different people coming together. There are different forms coming together. Uh, I, I'm from Northern Ireland, and I think it's very relevant now of what's happening in the news, yeah, yeah. that no matter what way we look or how we are, people can come together and embrace each other and get each other. We don't all have to rub each other up the wrong way. So yeah. that, in a way, is the narrative I'm looking for or, or what I want someone to look at one of my pieces and see balance and that it works. And it brings a certain amount of satisfaction of seeing something that, in that particular way that does work, which I hope it does work. <laughs> and again, it's sort of like the colour is really important. When I did the heads, I remember going to gallery and to start them off, I was doing um, smoke fired, very plain. And then one day I thought, I'm bright off with it. So I got a big tin of blue paint and did a bright blue yeah, teal. Yeah. I remember taking it to the gallery and the gallery sort of said, I'll never sell that. Oh, really? It didn't even get shown. It got sold as soon as it went through the door. Really? And hmm. Yeah. So people weren't expecting to see a, a blue head. or or um, And again, people sort of say, like as I say, I work in ceramics. I use paint. And it's, it goes very much against the tradition of British ceramics, that yeah, it yeah. should be glazed. It goes much more into the American tradition Whereas if you work in clay and you finish it, whatever way you want, but you know people are very restrictive in, in what they they want to view. So, so the color is very important to me. So how do you get the color on? Did do, do, you fire the the clay? Then do you, do you glaze the clay? Is that right? I fire the clay, then I construct. 
using sort of drills and okay. uh, metal and glue. I'm very good at glue. <laughs> I know all about glue. <laughs> and then once that's done, I'll do a base coat or an undercoat, much the same as a painter, and then I'll work up into the surface. And okay. it's really funny, I'll lay out in my studio, there'll be a whole line of pieces at the back, and it's almost like I, I look at them slightly from the side, and I, I know this sounds really daft. I yeah. think, what colour does that piece oh, feel like? And oh, okay. some of the pieces, which I don't think you have photographs of there. Oh, yeah, well, the totem pole is a perfect example. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll do the colours. And when I'm while I'm working, I'm constantly taking photographs of the construction. And also when I'm going through the internet, I take uh, photographs of colour combinations okay. that I think work out really well. So when I then look at, at the piece of work, I'll literally lay out the paints and each one is, is a colour worked out individually. Interesting. And just paint it that way. So so do the colours have a, emotions for you or is it more of a formal relationship between the colours? I think it's more a formal relationship between the colour. I don't think, I, I, I haven't got any deep knowledge. You can do a PhD, as you know, in colour. Mine is purely instinctive. I just sort of nuts, I suppose, why I do my research on the internet. Mm -hmm. I see what colours look really good. And, and occasionally I'll lay out all the colours that I have seen and then I'll think, yeah, but yeah. And change your mind and do it whatever way I have decided yeah. to do. <laughs> uh, as, uh, uh, also, I like to get into the markings. I, I, I would love to be someone who could write. I can't mm -hmm. write. I find it phenomenally difficult. So there's some of the pieces, again, you'll see on my website, where I'll do tiny little marks all over it. And it's almost my way of doing, writing something original. That is where I write, by doing my little marks and so my little bits. So, so you actually mean that the, literally the little marks are like, almost like text. That's right. And I almost feel like I'm reclaiming the surface. Mm. If you, some pieces, that, as I say, the pieces I've been doing the last year are quite complicated visually, so I haven't been doing that quite so much. But in some of the other pieces, I've done sort of like, oh, thousands of marks. There's one piece that I did, and it's one of those things you start to do on day one, and then day three you thought, why did I do this? Yeah, yeah, I'll have that. <laughs> Because as you probably, well, you know yourself, you've got the paintbrush and you yeah. just have got the right angle, the weight on the brush yeah. to cover the whole surface. And you don't want it to look with a complete unity that it looks exactly the same. Yeah. By every single touch of the brush, you get a different feel into the overall surface of the piece. Absolutely. But I, I, I like it. I mean, you've got like little, in the one I'm looking at here, you've got like little lozenge shapes on the... A dark yeah. green with a lighter green lozenge, and then little, actually, little weird sort of um, what would you call almost like um, stuff by the seaweed sort of shapes, or yeah, yeah. they're they're sort of almost like dreamlike shapes. Mm. So going right back to the heads, I, I there was I reached a point when I got really big and on doing the pieces, and they were really difficult to move around. And I thought, I have to move forward in this. And I, I suddenly got a paintbrush and just went wall round it. And then I thought, oh, gosh, that's just working right. Yeah. And I thought, I want the pieces to look like enough. There were pieces that were specifically designed to go outdoors. And I wanted to th think that you would look at them from quite afar and see like, them almost like abstraction. Yeah. And yeah. it's a bit like you and I having the, this conversation. We look at each other and we're looking at even like how, how our eyes are apart, how our noses, or how we move our face. We are subtly giving like, sort of vibrations yeah. about how we are and what we're all about, and we're reading that all the time. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. on those particular bits, I started using the lozenge shape. I, I don't know why, but it just seemed to be the right shape to use. And again, brightly coloured, and as I say, and I, I have moved those same symbols through into the pieces that I'm doing now at the moment. So can these can these pieces, even though you've, you've fired them, they're made out of clay and they're, they're painted, can they go outside or are they meant to be indoors? Yeah. No, some can go outside and some can go are indoors. Um, yeah, there's quite a range of them. I've done quite large ones that do go outdoors. 
um, again, if you look at my website, there's pieces called individuals, which are seven very large pieces that are set out in the line. They're being sort of rented out to various um, business premises in London, um, but they can go out. They've been out for quite a long time. Okay. And do you use different paint on those ones? Or like... uh, again, d d I think la uh, Lasco paint and Golden, hmm. but if you're using paint that is used for outdoor murals, I can't see the problem in using exactly the same thing on, on, on the ceramics. Yeah, if yeah. they go outdoors, and after that, there's several coats of lacquer and ultraviolet, uh, UHF, is it that you call it, um, lacquer on at the end. Also, I don't like shiny surfaces. I like very matte surfaces. Okay. So everything is covered with a matte uh, lacquer at the end to knock back. I don't like shining. Don't like shining. <laughs> <laughs> So, so each of these takes quite a lot of effort, just with the actual painting and layering it up at the end. I guess I think uh, the the yeah, um, because I'm res it takes a while to sort of like construct them. I I haven't. I remember when I, I came from a quite strict sort of Northern Irish background, good Presbyterians, yeah. and it's only when I went to sort of not that I was ever encouraged to do that, or, <laughs> but the schooling was there. Uh, and I realised that when I went out college all those years back that I had to learn to free up. I'd also worked in advertising for quite a long time okay. as well, where you had a, a meeting, you had a ride in time, and everything had to be pre-done. Mm. So it, it took a while for me to knock that out and realise you don't have to have things pre-done. Mm. You can just start off and you do have to have a certain feel about the balance of the things that you're making before you construct construct them but you don't have to have an idea of how it's going to be finished at the end you can let the whole process move on yeah yeah no, uh, absolutely i mean that's what you want in art isn't it you want it to sort of have yeah. that chaos and not really know where you're going and try and keep that in the the final piece and so I, like every yeah go on, go on. Right, every time I start, I think, oh, I can't do this. It's a bit like the blank uh, blank page syndrome. You think, oh, God, I'm not only really, I'm going to waste all that bloody clay and I'm going to make <laughs> something else that's going to be crap and yeah. where the hell's it going to go and I hit myself and then sit there and then sulk for a while and I go on Twitter and moan and then I come <laughs> back and I'm going to make something. You think, oh, this is really good. Yeah. And there's one in my workshop where I've got two windows one at either side, and at 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the light comes through, and it just hit, hits, and you think, gosh, that's good. I'm bloody good. And then half an hour, oh, I'm really awful. I'm really good. <laughs> Next one, oh, did I think I was good then? Yeah. And then you can try making it well. I think that's why I like clay rather than the bronze. For the bronze, you, you, you do your clay model, you hand it down to the technicians who are phenomenally skilled, and then they'll do what they have to do over it. And then it's nothing with what they do, but when they you hand it back, I always say, gosh, why didn't I spend a wee bit more time on that bottom right hand corner? <laughs> <laughs> Whereas clay, I could keep playing, oh, I'll do, I'll just do that a little bit better. I'll just try a little bit, bit more for to do that a little bit better at that particular line. And so the one so I'm looking at here, the, the, the blue one, it's got quite a sort of... Oh, jagged sort of um it almost looks like a well it does i think it's called cog it looks like a cog are they meant to be sort of fighting those cogs or are they well, it, it's sort of coming back to what i was sort of saying about different people getting on you might find someone that is a little bit edgy and um but if you if you embrace them in the right way things can work out well together we can get it to work out right I like um, with that, I particularly like the making process. It's quite repetitive to get okay, that yeah. point, because each one, if you can imagine the, the big flat piece that you saw earlier, yeah. that all has to be cut individually, and each bit of clay has to be cut, and it has to be just off the right hmm. temperature, or have gone off just enough to build on it. Okay. And then after that, there's quite a lot of working to get it to look pristine, to look at what, yeah. what well. So yeah. before it even goes into firing and then building into the next process of doing it. Hmm. But there is a, another, there is a, a piece that has got the, the clogs, cogs on both sides and that was really difficult. But when I finished that piece just by itself, 
and it was drying in the, the workshop, I thought there's something about it I, I, I like and I'm pleased I've done that. Because these are all, like my he heads I did before, these are all little people. These are all little individual things that I've got involved with while I've been working on it for several hours. That's weird. So you actually feel they like people as well, the abstract ones? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. That's quite interesting, actually. It's interesting, like you say, the heads stop talking to you, but then the abstract ones now talk to you instead. I think they do. I think if you're working on anything, as I say, when you're, you're working out the colour, and mm. I, I, I'm sure you as a painter do the same thing, you walk away from it, and, mm. and you're just looking at, at the side of your eye. Mm. And you don't want to make a pure intellectual decision on it. Because, no. in a way, it's an emotional decision mm. that comes from you, and also... It's not just about what you've read in the book or, or I've stolen from the Internet of Colour Combinations. It's about um, an emotional response mm. to the colours and how they're, they're put up together. Yeah, so that's, that's really interesting, actually. So, I mean, I, I mean, obviously, I don't know as much about sculpture as about painting. Um, but, I mean, I've always loved things like Barbara Hepworth and all those sort of things. always been really inspired by that sort of stuff. But um, the coloured sculpture is, is not something I've seen so much. Were there any other sculptors who inspired you to do this? Uh, well, Anthony Caro did. Um, yeah, exactly. You've got some worked in, in beautiful sort of colours. Mm. And I think more and more sculptors do now. But I didn't, I think I probably went to uh, America quite a, quite a long time ago, probably when I was in college. And I remember seeing the ceramics then, but I didn't, to be honest, I have never really been interested in ceramics. Mm. It's only lately over the last couple of years that I've met some people that have introduced me to it. I have always only been interested in sculpture yeah. or that side, side, side of it. Um, but about two years ago, I happened to go to an exhibition at Heiser and Worth on Ken Price. Mm. And it suddenly dawned on me that I must have seen his work 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, whenever I was in Massachusetts or, or around in Los Angeles as well. I think I went to a couple of museums there. Mm. Um, because I, so I could just identify with the work that he was doing and some of the American ceramists, rather, or in fact, there's one bit that um, I think Ken Price said, I'd rather pump petrol then go into a laboratory and work out a, a glaze for a paint my work. Mm. Uh, because it's not, That's some people are interested in that and some people are, aren't really. Absolutely. Um, so I suppose it's, if, what I get the most joy out of is looking at the Americans. And it's quite, I did a little bit of research on them the other week. And most have been born about between 1933, 1934. Uh, there's also a Welsh... Oh, Gareth Evans. Okay, cool. Yes, Funny. that's right. Again, like, sorry, I can't be able to see the colours. Oh, yeah, interesting. Interesting. I, don't, again, don't much more, um... Absolutely fabulous work. He uh, went and worked in America for a while. Uh, again, he was sort of saying about the prejudice in this country, that if you were an artist and you were an academic and you were a teacher... Uh, you were looked on in a different way, whereas in America, you were thought of as being a sculptor. Yeah, no, um, I, that, 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 that's actually a really, really interesting point about how people look at you here. If you do like, you know, if you do something like, uh, I mean, you know that artist Patrick Heron, he wrote lots of reviews and stuff. He gave up yeah. doing the reviews because everybody regarded him as a writer and not an artist. But yeah. interesting in America, they don't do that. It would be such a relief if that was like that. Yeah. Well, they take what they see. Mm. Uh, there seems to be a certain prejudice in this country. I, 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 I've had people walk into my workshop and say, oh, those are lovely pots. And me being sort of the easygoing person, I'll say, what the... Mm, <laughs> pots. Is there a hole in the top? I, it, it sort of really gets me so annoyed because they've got the set idea that because you work in yeah. ceramic that it's got to be a pot, or, oh, it's painted, oh, that can't be right. And it's the same with stonework as well. I've noticed people will uh, use paint on top of stone, and they'll sort of say, a bit, or people will turn around and sort of say, oh, you, you shouldn't do that, it should be natural. But they don't remember, they aren't going to around yeah. when all the cathedrals were painted beautiful colours. And I, again, I think the first time I've seen a piece of painted, painted ceramics, was in the, I think it was a Guggenheim in Los Angeles. Guggenheim? 
is it? Mm. And they had uh, brought out ceramics from under the sea that were like BC. Yeah, and yeah, they yeah, were yeah. Painted. And they were painted, of course, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The, the one, the, yeah. the, the one fascinating thing I just, just thought about your work when you showed me that book is that a lot of sculpture, when people do it, like the Barbara Hepworth things, that they always try and retain that kind of earthiness to the colours. It's quite yeah. interesting that that y there's an earthiness or a patina or a kind of sort of sandblasted feel, but yours is, is totally different to that. It's much more clean, crisp, abstract, sort of flat colour on the sculpture, which is actually really interesting. I think that's more to do with the material that I use. Maybe if I um, did a bronze, um, the, the, the finish might have to be different, different because mm. I like the, the texture of the clay so that when you look at one of my pieces, you will see the, the, you will see the clay there, yeah. the texture of the clay. And uh, the paint over the top does do several sort of blurs over it. Um, I think Hepworth did some um, colours and did sort of do uh, some uh, white, I think, inside some. Yeah, 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 she has, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's just a different sort of time and different sort of way of doing different things. Way of doing things. So, so we we better round it up soon. But just as slightly, like, I can't resist. It's the picture behind you. Is that by you as well, or is that? Not? I can't remember which one. It's this one here. Yeah. So, uh, no, I think I bought that uh, from the friend, or, and I think you might like, see the one over oh, there. Oh yeah, yeah, that's cool as well. Uh, which is beautiful. Yeah, um, very nice. Because I, I, I've seen some painters and sculpt, sculptors' houses who don't have any work from other people in their house. Yeah, yeah. I'm afraid I haven't got much of my work in here, but I've got a lot of other people. So oh, well, it gives. I am a lot. This piece over here, I, I just walked by and I saw it. I just loved it. The colour combination, she's from Bath um, yeah. um, Studios, Kate Kitty. And I think if you look over this way, yeah, yeah, I don't know if you can sort of see other paintings. Yeah, absolutely. On my wall. Um, oh, that's really cool. I like that. Uh, so nice. yes, there's other. Oh, those are etchings. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's others down here as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're all lurking around, chatting to you. <laughs> Right, so yeah, but uh, I think it's a real joy, I, I, and I think that's, I'd like to think that when people bring my work home, yeah. um, that they will get the joy that I get out of other people's work, um, yeah. Yeah, it's all part and parcel of it. That's Do really you nice. collect, have you got any work by other people? I've got, <laughs> not a lot actually, I guess, the irony is there's some work from a friend of mine who now lives in Mexico, I wish I'd bought it when we were at art school together. Um, but I know some other friends who've got it. And then I've got a little uh, etching from when I did this uh, etching exhibition. Um, but not as much as I would like, actually. Um, yeah. I think it's, I think okay. it's actually really, really good to collect the other people's stuff. And it does give you a bit more conversation, doesn't it? I think uh, um, my husband and I, whenever he would get a contract, we would buy a piece no. because of something because we felt it was good luck. Yeah, oh, that's, that's really good. Actually. good. I like that. I like so that. So something comes in, you're putting back, and I think this here uh, artist thing that's on the internet yeah. at the yeah. moment, yeah. when you sell a thousand pounds worth, you buy two hundred pounds worth. Mind you, to be honest, that's quite a big percentage. Ten percent, or is it twenty percent of what your sales yeah. are? You're giving it away. But I know a lot of artists are having a lot of difficulty at the moment. Yeah. But then saying that is brilliant because artists are doing smaller pieces. As yeah. uh, the other artist that we interviewed the other day was yeah. doing the bench ones. Um, yeah, yeah. I, it's good that they're able to get the work out there. It is brilliant. It is brilliant. Anyway, I've absolutely loved chatting. And I think uh, yeah. on that point where you talk about the joy it brings into the, the people's houses, I think that's absolutely fantastic. So, um, yeah. Patricia, I've absolutely loved chatting. And I'm right. looking forward to seeing him in the, in the flesh, as it were. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cheerio. Bye. 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 Bye.